Hello, and welcome to Buffy and the Art of Story, Season 5. If you love Buffy the Vampire Slayer and you love creating stories or just taking them apart to see how they work, you're in the right place. Today we're talking about Season 5, Episode 20, Spiral, where Buffy flees from glory to protect Dawn and the Knights of Byzantium chase the gang across the desert. I am Lisa M. Lilly mystery and thriller, author, story expert, and founder of writingasasecondcareer.com. Along with the breakdown of Spiral, I'll talk about how Spiral weaves in questions about Buffy's escape plan, Ben's and Glory's origins, and more to keep viewers engaged and watching until the end, weaving in exposition through conflict versus just dumping exposition out as General Gregor will do in the episode and how both of those approaches can work to inform your audience. The small moments and comments that foreshadow the shocking ending where Buffy shuts down and the cartoon imagery of season five, which continues in this episode. There are no spoilers, except at the end where I'll talk about foreshadowing. Okay, let's dive into the Hellmouth. Spiral aired the first time on May 8, 2001. It was written by Stephen S. DeKnight and directed by James A. Contner. The last episode, Tough Love, ended with a major reversal for Buffy. Tara pointed to Dawn and called her pure green energy right as Glory had just found the group. Glory realized Dawn was the key and the episode ended. That was part of why I thought it might be a two-part episode with Spiral, though I think both of them work as standalones as well. Spiral begins with an opening conflict, as all stories should, and this one implies what happened in the previous episode. Buffy and friends are in a room together, and the outside wall is broken down. Glory stares at them. Tara points to Dawn in awe, and Glory looks thrilled. Buffy grabs Dawn's arm, breaks down the interior door, and runs into the hallway away from Glory. Willow does a spell that shoves Glory back and creates an invisible barrier against her. And this is a spell we will see again in the episode. Outside, Buffy and Dawn run across campus. Dawn says she can't keep going and nearly falls. It doesn't quite ring true to me that she can't keep running. As far as we know, they haven't been running for miles, but perhaps it's a much longer run than we realized. So Buffy picks Dawn up and runs carrying her, but at just short of a minute through the episode, Glory blocks their way and says, I really hate it when people touch my things. Last word, Slay Runt. And Buffy says, just one, truck. Right then, a giant tanker truck runs Glory over, and Buffy takes off with Dawn. Glory lands on the roof of a car on her back, and she's saying, no, not now. And at 1 minute 13 seconds in, she turns into Ben, who says, oh, God. And we cut to credits. We return at 2 minutes 13 seconds in, Dawn is very excited and she's telling Giles, Anya, and Xander the story of Buffy's triumph over Glory, ending with, quote, and Buffy's just standing there, not even blinking, like, bring it on, and wham. Giles is very impressed until Buffy, who stands staring out the window of Xander's apartment, her arms folded, interrupts, a truck hit her. And Anya says, you threw it at her? Buffy doesn't know how Glory got away. The truck couldn't have slowed her down for more than a second. Giles tries to reassure her that everyone's safe, but Buffy tells him that's wrong. They're not safe. They barely escaped each time from Glory, and now she knows Dawn's the key. As they struggle for what to do, Anya says, piano. And Xander says, yes, because that's what we used to kill that big demon that one time. No, wait, that was a rocket launcher. I love this reference to previous seemingly unkillable villains. 
And this one, of course, is to the judge from season two, who they did kill with a rocket launcher. And it is a nice way to remind audience members who saw season two and also to get in a little bit of not so much backstory for new viewers, but a flavor of it. So you don't have to spill out everything. Just that reference tells us that Buffy and the gang have faced these kinds of villains before, although obviously a rocket launcher isn't going to work here. Anya goes on and on about a piano dropping on cartoon characters. And this is the first, the piano reference in her specific talk about the Roadrunner and Wiley Coyote cartoons and Elmer Fudd that goes to that cartoon theme. And I have to think a bit about what that means for season five because we had Glory earlier saying Buffy and her cartoon pals. And now we get these cartoon references. And it gets more specific because Giles sarcastically suggests maybe they should paint a fake tunnel on a mountain. As the gang moves on to other ways to fight Glory, Buffy says they can't fight Glory ever. She's too strong. They won't win with stakes or spells or pulling out some uranium power core, which is another great, very quick reference to season four, Adam, another unkillable enemy. Buffy says, though, that Glory is a god who's coming for them, so let's not be there when she arrives. And Anya says, run away? Finally, a sensible plan. Xander says that's not what Buffy meant, but it is. She tells them no one goes home, pack up the supplies they need, and go. Xander says they'll need a bigger vehicle than his, and she says she'll handle it all. So that's at 4 minutes, 44 seconds, and it does two things. One, it raises a story question. How will they all get out of town and where will they go? And story questions are an important way to keep your viewers hanging in there. It gives them a reason to keep watching or reading if you're writing a story or novel. This also is the story spark or inciting incident for the episode. It's right about 10% through where we most commonly see that, and it gets the main plot rolling. So this is one argument for Spiral being its own standalone episode, not part two of Tough Love. Because in other designated two-part episodes, typically it was hard to find a clear story spark for a distinct second episode plot. The next scene takes place in Glory's mansion. A minion dusts off the dress that Glory and then Ben wore, complaining she'll never be able to mend it, and she asks Ben if he knows what led to the sartorial tragedy. He tells her that's not how it works, and she knows it. So now we'll get some exposition through minor conflict. This exchange tells us that Ben doesn't remember things that Glory did and said. Now the minion explains why she asked this question when she already knew that about Ben. And I like that because I really don't enjoy dialogue where one character tells the other something they already know just because the audience needs to know it. You can certainly do that, but it is the weakest way to convey exposition because it is so artificial. But the minion says that she just thought perhaps Ben saw something lying around that gave him a clue to what happened. A key turned human, perhaps, quote, lounging about, unattended did, unquote. He says he'd never tell her, and she asks why he fights against the inevitable. And she refers to Glory with one of the many, uh, her magnificence, or these other phrases the minions use, and Ben chides her for not just saying Glory's name. It's her God after all. The minion chides Ben for being so hostile to Glory. He only exists because of her divine greatness. And Ben says, you mean her divine failure, don't you? 
Another good story question. We wonder, what does Ben mean by that? He goes on about how nothing in his life is really his. The only thing he really cared about, Glory took away being a doctor. And he wanted to be a doctor, to be close to people, witness their lives and deaths, be part of everyday humanity. But then he says, or maybe it was the drugs. Find the right combination. Glory stays buried. This is both exposition, a little more in the nature of a character just spilling out what we need to know, but it's still in the context of some conflict there between his view and the minion's view, and it raises another story question about the mystery of Ben and Glory. The minion thinks that Ben should be thrilled to be part of Glory's radiance, but he points out that when Glory gets the key back, he ceases to exist. The minion responds, true, this oh-so-appealing form will of necessity be shrugged off. And Ben says, not if I get the key first. And the minion says, and if you did, what then? Could you do it? Take a human life with your own hands? Another story question for the viewer. She urges him to accept his fate. He said it himself, this life was never really his, but Ben says, it doesn't matter how I came by it, it's mine, and I plan on keeping it. So this doubles down on that question, what will Ben do? And it's a bit of a shift because we have seen before that Ben seems to want to protect Dawn at least consciously, though he unconsciously betrayed her, but now he is saying he'll do whatever he can to protect his life. I did find this scene a little bit slow, maybe because of re-watching, and I know these things, but many of these things any viewer the first time around would know from previous episodes. It's a good example of how, even with some minor conflict, putting in exposition that repeats things can put a little bit of a drag on a story. At 7 minutes 26 seconds in, the Scoobies wait on a corner, and Anya says, anyone else feel that? And Willow says, what? And Anya responds, a cold draft of paralyzing fear. Giles urges calm and says it'll all be fine when Buffy arrives, but just then a giant camper pulls up. The doors open. Giles looks in and says he feels oddly worse. Spike in dark sunglasses sits in the driver's seat. Giles orders him out, but Buffy, who sits at the table looking over maps, says Spike's there because they need him. If Glory finds them, he's the only one besides Buffy that has any chance to protect Dawn. Giles' attitude and Xander's, because he also protests, must be a fallout from when Drew came to town and Spike tortured Buffy or tried to or threatened to. And I get that they would still be angry at him, but I'm not sure why they don't cut him a little slack after intervention. Xander had a bit of sympathy for Spike, seeing how beat up he was, and Buffy must have told them that Spike did not reveal that Dawn was the key and that she wasn't worried about that. Now, she probably didn't relay her conversation with him or that she kissed him, but it is another example in season five how we have a bit of sliding back and forth of character attitudes where it doesn't quite make sense. I'm curious what any of you think about that. Did you think that Xander and Giles would still be not wanting Spike on the team? Buffy is clear though when Xander protests she stands and says look this isn't a discussion he stays get over it. She stalks into the bedroom at the back of the camper and slams the door. At 8 minutes 44 seconds two Knights of Byzantium are at the hospital signing out their friend Orlando the knight who was in the psych ward after Glory sucked out his brains. All three of them are disguised in jeans, flannel shirts, and caps that cover the marks on their forehead. The knight who signs out Orlando is named Dante, and he tells the others, he told them how easy it would be to get Orlando out, but just then the nurse from behind them says, hey, 
One of them starts to take out his dagger, but the nurse just wants her pen back. This is a nice, very quick way to show how committed the knights are and how dangerous they are. In the woods, the three of them meet a general named Gregor. Orlando raves about the pretty little shiny girl, and Gregor finally realizes Orlando is talking about the key, that he saw it, and that the monks made the key human. Immediately, the general says they must find the slayer because she protects the key, and he says, quote, we end this now, end quote. A whole battalion emerges from the foggy forest and starts marching. At 10 minutes, 26 seconds in, Giles drives the camper. The others, except for Buffy, gather around the table. Xander is feeling very car sick, and Spike complains Giles is driving too slow. He tells Dawn he should have stolen the Porsche he had his eye on. There was just enough room for him, Dawn, and Big Sis. Xander staggers to the passenger front seat and complains about Spike. Giles, with a sour look, says Buffy has a point. Spike might be useful in a confrontation with Glory. Xander's also worried about Buffy. He's never seen her like this. Giles reassures him she's been through a lot lately and she just needs a chance to regroup. One of those comments that sets up the ending where Buffy shuts down. Willow's studying a spell book and Dawn asks if she's having any luck and Willow says, uh, if you define luck as the absence of success, plenty. Anya's excited to show the frying pan she brought so that she can make tasty fried meat products for snacks. Then Tara opens the blind and Spike howls in pain as the sunlight burns his hand. Willow pulls Tara back and tells her no and Tara cries. Spike, cradling his hand, says it's no big deal. His hand has already stopped smoking. And he tells Tara, go ahead and play peekaboo with the sunlight all she wants. But Tara cries that the light is gone. It's all dark, all dark. And at 13 minutes, 35 seconds, we cut to the psych ward. And the patients there, too, are all saying it's all dark and soon, soon, soon. Usually, before this point in the episode, we see the first major plot turn. I think of it as the one-quarter twist because that's usually where you see it in a novel. It shifts around a little more in TV episodes. It should come from outside the protagonist, spin the story in a new direction, and raise the stakes. So we haven't quite seen that here. There's a bit of a hint with this soon, soon, and the next scene, the minions are casting bones one of them talks about all the signs being in alignment. It's time for victory. Another says all they need to do is seize the moment and squeeze until it bleeds. So we get a sense that something big has happened. But there is a more major turn coming. At 14 minutes, 6 seconds in, Buffy dozes in the back bedroom of the camper. Dawn joins her and thanks Buffy, who is puzzled and says, for what? Dawn says, for everything. And Buffy says, yeah, I'm doing a great job. Dawn assures her she is, but Buffy doesn't feel like the slayer, the chosen one. Monsters are supposed to flee from her, and now she's the one fleeing. Dawn tries to deny it, but Buffy calls it, quote, the big scaredy runaway, end quote. This shows a crisis of identity for Buffy. Perhaps worse or or the next worst step in what she's already been dealing with because she's been struggling with does being a slayer make her too hard to love, but at least she could be the slayer, could fight the monsters until the cows come home, as she said in the previous episode, and now she can't even do that. But Dawn says, it's the most amazing thing anyone's ever done for me. And Buffy, in a quiet voice, responds, it just keeps coming. Glory, Riley, Tara, Mom. Dawn tells her there's a bright side. At least things can't get any crazier, right? An arrow shoots through the wall, and at 15 minutes, 50 seconds, Buffy says, you know this is your fault for saying that, right? I love that Buffy still has some of her trademark humor here. And this is definitely a turn for the worse from outside Buffy that raises the stakes. So while it's late, we could see it as the first major plot turn of this episode. 
knights of Byzantium on horseback chase the camper, shooting arrows, including flaming arrows. And some of the knights have axes and swords. Buffy sees them through the window and sighs. Not a typical Buffy response. Another hint of how overwhelmed and exhausted she feels. She goes to the front to warn Giles, the others duck as arrows start flying, and Tara looks out the window and says, Horsies. Willow pulls Tara away from the window just before a metal-tipped arrow goes through a wall near her. Giles calls out to ask about weapons, and Spike points out that he's driving one. Willow says, don't hit the horsies. Buffy says, we won't. Then she leans in close to Giles and says, aim for the horsies. It's 17 minutes, 10 seconds. The knights start climbing up onto the roof and thrusting their swords down through it. One almost hits Xander. Spike grabs another and holds it in place and tells Buffy, quote, now might be a good time for something heroic, end quote. She climbs out the ceiling hatch onto the roof, and then there is a terrific fight scene as she spars with one knight after another, at one point getting almost knocked off the roof herself, but she keeps climbing back. More and more knights keep coming. We have a special treat for the break today. For those who are publishing their own work or thinking about it, I asked Rachel Wharton from Kobo to talk with us about some tips on publishing on Kobo and on promoting your books there. You'll hear more from her later in this episode as well, but more important, Rachel is a huge Buffy the Vampire Slayer fan, so at the end of the season, you will get to hear a bonus episode of Rachel talking with me about season five, including a lot of the things that happen in Spiral. For now, though, here is our conversation about Kobo part one. So, Rachel, I'm so happy to have you here. Can you tell us a little bit about your position at Kobo Writing Life and maybe what's a day in your work life look like? Yeah, definitely, Lisa. Um, First of all, thank you so much for having me. I am very excited to be here. And so my position at Kobo Writing Life is the promotion specialist. It really changes day to day. I wouldn't say I have like a typical day, but to kind of give you a run through of what I cover. Oh, before you do, do you want to talk about what is a promo for people who haven't published their work on Kobo yet or maybe have and they don't know what it is? Definitely. So we offer what we call our promotions tab. This is still technically in a beta phase, so it doesn't appear on everybody's account automatically. So if you are listening and you have a Kobo Writing Life account and on your dashboard, it does not say promotions up at the top, email us at writinglife at Kobo.com. Ask for the promo tab, happily give it to you. And these promotions are opportunities to offer your price or your title, usually at a discount, to get your title in front of more eyes of customers. These can range from price drop promotions to our free page to percentage off promotions to buy more, save more. And yeah, it's a great way to draw in new readers to finding your work. When I've had promos, I see a huge increase in sales, not just of the promoted book or downloads if it's free, but following that. So I I find it a wonderful feature. Why, thank you. And honestly, it's great. Like you said, for read through as well. If you promote your first book in a series or a first box set in a series, get people hooked. It's not just going to be the title that you promote that will find new readers. It could be an entire series. It could be your body of work. So let's go back to, I interrupted you. So what is your job like? What do you do? All promotions come through me. So that involves kind of building out our promotions calendar very far in advance. Today is what, September 7th. I just submitted requests for promotions for November. In a couple of weeks, I will be doing December. So really building out our calendar in advance, just kind of what promotions we're going to run that it involves emailing the authors. I also need to reach out to the Kobo teams to get like the creative support, make sure we have really pretty landing page headers. Once the promo is on the promo tab, I go through the titles and do the approval and unfortunate rejection process, which means that listeners who are on Kobo either 
love me a lot or they have some choice words for me. I am sure no one has choice words for you. (laughs) I really hope not. I do my best to include as many different authors as possible. I also run our new release calendar. So if you have new releases that are coming out on Kobo, email us, let us know. We actually have a new release form available on our help desk. I also run a price drop calendar as well. So if you have a book bub or you're running your own promotion, email us. We have bargain lists on site that we can add titles to. On top of all of that, and that is just for like the Kobo writing like run promotions, I also work with our audiobook team to run audiobook promotions. I work with our content sales team to get Kobo Writing Life titles included in their promotions. For example, we had a Labor Day long weekend sale in Canada, the 500 under five. Um, Those are promotions where your titles will appear alongside traditionally published titles as well, all mixed in. And then I also work with Overdrive. And then also I'm in constant contact with authors answering questions about promos, getting feedback about what kind of promotions authors want to see. If you have a great promo idea, email us, writinglife at Kobo.com. Let us know. I obviously cannot guarantee anything, but it's always nice to know what authors are looking for. And then I also get to host the podcast. I've had some trouble on Kobo getting nonfiction book sales, and I haven't seen a lot of promos there. And I wondered if that might be in the future Uh, Or if you have thoughts on that. When it comes to nonfiction, we uh, admittedly don't run a lot of nonfiction only promos. Our merchandising team runs a few. As far as Kobo Writing Life titles go, we don't have a huge wealth of nonfiction. However, we run a lot of all genre promotions. So always submit your titles to all genre promos, unless it says like no nonfiction, but it, it does not say no nonfiction. Submit in all of the promotions that I run, because there are the KWL specific ones, as well as the aforementioned content sales ones. I always try to include a nonfiction list, a nonfiction carousel on our page. So definitely submit. And then if it's a business nonfiction book, especially, or you're an expert in writing a type of nonfiction, reach out to us and offer to do a blog post, offer to get like an interview on the podcast. We're always looking for supplementary content, especially on the blog, to try to find more readers through other creative ways. And if you have the means for audiobooks, nonfiction audiobooks are huge. Personally, as an audiobook listener, I much prefer nonfiction in audiobook form over, I mean, I'll obviously read nonfiction, but I love nonfiction audiobooks. So that those would be my biggest pieces of advice. Submit to all genre promos. If you're an expert in a certain field when it comes to nonfiction writing, or if your book is about the business of writing, email us, offer a blog spot, offer a a podcast interview, and try for an audiobook. Those are my my three tips. Yeah, that is very helpful because that never occurred to me, the all genre. I think in my brain, I just went, oh, all fiction genres. The other points are great as well. And you mentioned audiobooks. I'll sometimes listen to a novel on audio, but I really like to read them. But nonfiction, I'm with you. I enjoy listening to it and sometimes even take it in better. And then sometimes authors will love this. Then I buy the book too, so that I can have it. I do the exact same thing. So that leads me to, I know that on Kobo, you can publish both ebooks and audiobooks, which to me is a a big plus. Are there other things that you would want to highlight about why why should authors who self-publish consider Kobo if they haven't done that already? So not to like to my own horn and talk about my job again, but the promotions. A lot of our promos are available only to titles that are uploaded directly to uh, Kobo Writing Life. Any KWL specific promo, so our buy more, save mores, our VIP sales, our monthly like percentage off promo code sales, those are only available to KWL authors, as are all of our audiobook promotions. The promos, huge plus. And also when you're uploading directly to Kobo Writing Life, rather than going through an aggregator, you don't have to pay those aggregator fees, which is always a plus as well. Just a little bit more earnings. Yeah, I I find that to be a big plus as well. And for those who haven't done it, personally, I think Kobo's interface for uploading is the easiest one. I know it can be hard to upload your files. You have to learn all these different 
uh, different ways the fields are laid out. And, and to me, and maybe it's just something about the way my brain works, Kobos is very intuitive and it, it makes sense to me. I never find myself thinking, I, well, I can't find this field or what do they mean by that? It's, it's pretty clear. So I, I think it's a very easy platform to use. Also, another plus of uploading with us is our team is great. We're small but mighty. And you email us with a question, you will talk to a real person like always. I figured it was a real person or you had really amazing AIs. Inside the camper, Dawn helps bandage Spike's injured hand. The window near her shatters and a knight grabs her. Anya finally gets him away by hitting him with the frying pan. This reminded me of the episode Ted, where Buffy bested Ted using a frying pan. It's also more of that cartoon imagery, which Anya calls out by saying, it's not a piano, but hey. At 19 minutes, 44 seconds, Buffy seems to have gotten the better of the knights. She has knocked them all off the roof. None of them are pursuing. Inside, Giles breathes a sigh of relief, asks if everyone is all right, and they seem to be. He shifts his eyes to the road again, and a lone knight rides straight toward him and flings a spear. The spear hits Giles. The trailer veers, throwing Buffy off the roof onto the ground. And at 20 minutes, 7 seconds, the trailer rolls over and we cut to commercial. This is a major reversal, which we typically see at the midpoint of the episode. But there is going to be an even bigger one in a moment that will make things worse. Buffy and her friends walk until they find an old boarded up gas station where they take shelter. And Anya says to Buffy, uh, you have another plan, right? One that doesn't involve pointy knives and a Winnebago? Buffy says they can't stay there, but she doesn't know where to go. Another hint of what's happening inside Buffy building on the overwhelm and a callback to the Buffy bot. We had those moments where she said things like, why are you all looking at me? Or I don't know. But the Buffy bot was not troubled by that because she's a bot and her programming didn't include being able to feel the way Buffy feels now. Willow adds to the distress by saying Giles needs medical help, but it's it's true. Willow's not trying to pile on Buffy and Buffy says she just needs a minute. So another reference to if she could just have a minute or two to regroup, but she is not getting it because at 21 minutes, 18 seconds, almost exactly the middle of the episode, a flaming arrow shoots through the wall. So this is a major reversal for Buffy. Usually at the midpoint of any story, we see a major reversal or the protagonist going all in on the quest or both. Now, if we see this as a two-part episode with Tough Love, this would be the last major plot turn that grows from the midpoint and takes the story in yet another direction, driving it toward the climax. And here, this turn does grow in a way from that two-part midpoint where Glory found out Dawn was the key because it prompted Buffy to flee, which puts her in this situation. On the other hand, it more directly comes from the Knight Orlando telling the general about the key being human and a little girl. So that's an argument for this story being all its own, not part two of Tough Love. Xander peers out and sees this battalion of knights, and Xander says, we've got company, and they brought a crusade. More arrows come through, knights start breaking in, and Buffy fights while Willow starts an incantation. General Gregor fights his way in, sees Dawn, and points his sword at her and says, the key. Buffy knocks the sword away, fights him, Willow finishes the spell, and the knights outside and inside fly backwards. Now there is an invisible barrier around the building, and the general has been knocked out. Outside the night, Dante calls two clerics to do a counterspell. Inside, Buffy asks Willow how long it will hold, and Willow says, half a day maybe? She looks outside and goes on, or until Heckle and Jekyll punch a hole through it. 
And Spike says, so what's the story with these role-playing rejects? And Buffy looks at the knocked-out general and says, let's find out. At 24 minutes, Gregor, the general, is bound to a pole. Buffy faces him as Dawn looks on, and he tells her he's a general. Buffy asks a general in charge of what? Getting captured? But he tells her he's not afraid of her. He calls her a child and says, looking at Dawn, the instrument of chaos must be destroyed. And Buffy says, look at her that way again, and she will be the last thing you see. Gregor responds, as I've been told, you protect the key of the beast. And Buffy says, it's not that simple. Gregor agrees the key was given breath and life, but it makes no difference. And he recites that chant, the key is the link, the link must be severed, such is the will of God. She tells him Dawn doesn't remember being the key. The only thing she remembers is growing up with a mother and sister who love her. And Buffy says, what kind of God would demand her life for something that she has no control over? We are not your enemy. Tell your men to stand down. Gregor refuses. This is such a commentary on beliefs about what the will of a divine being is, beliefs about religion, because it seems from a logical standpoint, why couldn't Buffy and Gregor join forces? But when you dive into Gregor's beliefs, one is that he has this divine mandate. He has to destroy the key. No other way. But also... You can see it from both perspectives. Gregor understands that Don is human. He may even understand the unfairness of it, but he is looking at it from a, I, I think in philosophy, it's a utilitarian perspective. The good of all of humanity outweighs the death of one human. And as I've talked about before, a values conflict is the strongest conflict you can have between characters because for Buffy, the value of protecting not just humanity as a whole, but protecting individuals is so strong and protecting an individual often outweighs the good of protecting humanity in general. She will strive and strive and strive to find a way to protect each human being. Buffy is drawn away by Tara's cries. Willow's trying to hold Tara back. Tara is struggling, saying, it's time, it's time. And Willow, frantic, looks at Buffy and says, we have to do something. She, she can't just stay this way, Buffy. And Buffy squeezes her eyes shut. So another building of what's happening inside Buffy as she tries to shut this out. We cut to the psych ward and the patients there are saying, it's time, time, time. The nurse tells them, no, it's not time for their meds, but they break free of their restraints. Outside the gas station at 26 minutes, 51 seconds, Orlando, the brain sucked knight, also says, it's time, it's time. Dante tells him there's nothing to fear. The beast will never know his heart. And he kills Orlando, then yells at the clerics to get that barrier down now. So we don't know exactly what that means, the beast getting Orlando's heart, but what this does demonstrate is how dedicated, again, these knights are and how much they see glory as this greater evil. So he will kill his friend to protect him. At 27 minutes, 20 seconds in, Buffy stands with Giles, who is in great pain and probably dying, and tells him she's sorry. They should have stayed. None of this would have happened. I'm not sure if she's right on that, that they should have stayed where they were because the knights would still have found them, though she doesn't know that, and Glory could have more easily found them. But maybe she's thinking that they could have split up. She could have taken Dawn, gone with Spike, as Spike suggested, but she wasn't willing to leave anyone on their own. And Giles' response suggests that's it because he assures her she did what was necessary and she placed her heart above all else. And Giles says, I'm so proud of you. You've come so far. You're everything a watcher, everything I could have hoped for. And I tear up 
every time at that line and the way Anthony Stewart Head delivers it. It is so clearly him saying that as a father to Buffy. And it's a great example of why this series speaks to people on such a deep level because this hits you if you're someone who had a parent who said that to you, that brings back those emotions. If you're someone who never got to hear those words from a parent, it really hits you. And I am in that second category, uh, probably with my dad. He just wasn't a very expressive person, but with my mother because I didn't share her religious views or I rejected them as an adult. Uh, she was very clear that I was not a good person. And some of the things I did, she appreciated that I did for her and my dad. I was always a disappointment. Nothing could overcome that difference. Buffy squeezes Giles' hand and she turns toward Willow and tells her to open a door. At 28 minutes, 40 seconds, Buffy and Xander step out. They face Dante and another night and Buffy asks them to let medical aid through for Giles. Dante refuses. The two are about to fight, but Xander points out that war has rules, quote, or at least there should be if you're as honorable as you think you are, end quote. And he adds, plus we do have your general forehead guy. At 29 minutes, 37 seconds, Willow does a spell to make the payphone work. And Buffy says to someone, I need to ask you a really big favor. At 29 minutes, 58 seconds, Ben drives up to the gas station. Inside, he says to Buffy, you uh, forgot to mention the costume party outside. Buffy apologizes. She didn't know who else to call. He says it's fine. It's not how he pictured seeing her again, but he'll take what he can get. Spike in the background rolls his eyes. Ben notices Dawn and gives her a look and we cut to commercial. So again, raising the story question or reminding us, what will Ben do? Will he try to kill Dawn? At 30 minutes, 45 seconds, Giles is breathing hard, still in pain, but Ben thinks he got him stabilized. He warns Buffy there's a lot of damage and they need to get Giles out of there. Buffy thinks the guys with the pointy swords might have other ideas, and Ben says, don't they always? Now Spike leaves in disgust and goes into the back room. When Buffy tells Ben this must seem weird to him, he tells her he's seen things she wouldn't believe and goes on, don't worry about me. I won't leave until I've worn out my welcome. Very true. Great foreshadowing. In the back room, Spike struggles to light a cigarette with his bandaged hand and Xander lights it for him, then says, you know those things will kill you. Oh, right. I mentioned today how much I don't like you, and Spike says, might have let it slip in once or twice. They start talking about how they'll both be chopped to bits if the knights have their way. Spike wants to make a break for it. Xander says the knights will hack and slash away at them. Spike says at least some of them will make it. If they all stay, they all die. Buffy hears the last of this and says, no, we're all going to make it. I'm not losing anyone. The general chuckles and comments on the dissension in the ranks. Buffy hits him and tells him to shut up. He tells her she still has no idea what she's gotten herself into, and Buffy says, why don't you tell me? This, to me, shows Buffy's strength, because despite her anger, despite the way the general is treating her, he may have information she needs, and she is willing to hear it. She says, okay, tell me. At 33 minutes, 20 seconds, Gregor tells her the beast is from a demon dimension, which she and uh, the audience already know, that she ruled with a vengeance with two other hell gods, a triumvirate of despair. And then he starts getting to some things that I'm not sure we heard before, that the beast's power and lust for pain and misery grew beyond what the other two could stand. They were afraid of her, afraid she'd seize the whole dimension. So they struck first and won, but barely. And they cast her out to this, quote, lower plane of existence, end quote, forcing her to live and die trapped in the body of a mortal, a newborn male created as her prison. It's her only weakness. 
and Buffy says, kill the man and the god dies. But Gregor tells her the man's identity was never discovered and that Glory finds ways to escape for brief periods until she's exhausted and forced back in. Which I guess explains why Glory does so much through her minions. I never thought about that before, that she might be conserving her energy because once she is stuck in Ben again, she doesn't know when she'll get back out. I wish we had known this earlier in the season because it really would have helped me with feeling that Glory posed more of a danger and that her not coming after Buffy more often or following up more or acting directly instead of through the minions was just a convenience for the writers. It was just handy that Glory didn't happen to do those things. Dawn asks about the key and Gregor says it's been around almost as long as the beast. It has absolute power and countless generations of knights sacrificed their lives to find and destroy it before its wrath could be unleashed, but the monks found it first and hid it with their magic. So if this is a standalone episode. There should be a last major plot turn. It it actually should have already happened a while back, and that turn should grow from the midpoint, take the story in yet another new direction, and it sometimes raises the stakes, and as I mentioned, drive the story toward the climax. For this episode, it should grow out of the trailer rollover or the attack on the gas station and spin the story. So probably it was when Buffy called Ben around 30 minutes through, which is quite early. The fact that we don't see a very distinctive one is a little evidence on the side of this is really a two-part episode. So instead of seeing another major turn here, what we have from the three-quarter turn of the two-part, which is, is that gas station attack, is simply just Things get worse, things get worse as we head to the climax. Buffy asks why the monks didn't destroy the key and Gregor calls them fools. They thought they could harness the power of the key for the forces of light and they paid with their blood. Gregor tells Dawn she was created to open the door between dimensions and the beast will use her to go back to her own dimension and seize power. This is a long stretch of exposition, and this is what I alluded to in the beginning, where a character just tells us all these things we need to know. Most of it is information Buffy doesn't have, so we don't have that problem of characters talking about something just to tell the audience, but it does lack the engagement or power that a conversation with conflict has. Sometimes that information dump can feel artificial or like the writer is just saying, here, let me tell you what you need to know. Here, it works better than in most stories because Buffy needs to know this. It's much like when Giles tells our friends about what they need to know, which the audience also needs. Also here, the tension is kept high because we've got these Knights of Byzantium outside. Willow's barrier may fail at any time. They are aiming to kill Dawn. Buffy doesn't have a plan for what to do. And there's obvious tension between Buffy and Gregor. He wants to kill Dawn as well. And there's an added layer because Buffy probably doesn't want Dawn to have to hear this. Dawn is insisting on answers. She wants to know and Buffy would like to protect her even from the truth. So that's why this large chunk of exposition works reasonably well. Now that Gregor has said what Glory wants, Buffy laughs and says, that's it. That's Glory's master plan to go home. And now a little bit more of my conversation with Rachel about Kobo. I don't know how many authors, people who are working on Kobo also write or publish, but it feels like there are some who do that really understand the process. If 
we're not writers. All of us are incredibly avid readers. Um, if there's one thing that almost everybody at Kobo has in common, it is we all love books. We have several staff picks conversations going on at any time. One of the members of my team has a reading goal for the year of 200 books and she's going to reach it. It's wild. And we all read so differently as well, but we all love to talk about books. A couple of us write. We do all attempt NaNoWriMo every year. Oh, nice. And we all love helping authors find their readers because we're readers ourselves. One other question specifically about promos. If an author applies for a promotion and they get turned down, does that mean anything? Should they try again with that book? Absolutely try again. The thing with promotions is every single one of them has limited space. Even if it's a promotion that I'm running and it's just for KWL authors, we're always trying to strike a balance between having enough books in the promo, but we also don't, you don't want to have too many. You don't want to include authors and then have their book get lost. We want the promotion to be successful for as many people who participate as possible. So 99% of the time, do not take that personally. Because it is just a space thing, especially for our really popular promos. Like our daily deal is probably one of the most competitive promotions. That promo is uh, you get featured on the homepage of Kobo.com. And there's one spot. We get three of those promotions a month and we get 60 to 100 titles submitting for that promotion. So it's tough. And another example I love to use is on our free page, we have the free first in series carousel. There are six spots every week. And every week there are over 100 submissions. So while I get to say yes to six books, I have to say no to 94. But if you find that you've submitted to a promotion with the same book over and over and over again, especially if it's one of the promotions that has a lot more space, if you find you're submitting the same title over and over again to say a buy more, save more or to a percentage off sale, take a look at your cover. That's the first thing that we see when we're looking through titles. So take a look at your cover, compare it to other books in your genre. Is it comparable? Does it fit your genre? So definitely do that. Take a look at your blurb. And another thing I always recommend is when you're submitting to a uh, any promotion, whether it's a price drop promo or a buy more, save more, look at your pricing. We're always looking for pretty pricing is what I like to call it, optimized pricing. If you have your title in US dollars only, and it's $2.99. I'm going to mess up this conversion, but it's going to show up on the Canadian store as like $6.52 or $3.52, which doesn't look as pretty. So if it's coming down to two books with equally good covers, equally good blurbs, one of them is priced $3.99 in all stores, and one of them is priced $2.99 in the US, but wonky pricing elsewhere, we're going to go for the, the prettier one, for lack of a better term. So always check your pricing. And if you're applying for a daily deal, Right. Or a double daily deal. Make sure your price drop is, I don't want to say super significant. You don't want to undersell your book. But if you have a huge box set that's on sale from like $20.99 to $4.99, that's going to look more appealing to a customer than an ebook that's going from $2.99 to $0.99. Cents. Those are all of the things that we consider. But keep submitting because 99% of the time it is just lack of space. Our promotions are very popular. And I imagine that keeping the number of slots low is part of what makes them work so well. Absolutely. And I will say when it comes to promotions like the daily deal and double daily deal and the free page, personally, I do my best to offer that spot to as many different authors as possible. So if you get one and you're like, yes, I've cracked it, but then you don't get another one, again, don't take it personally, just trying to spread the wealth. So if you just had a certain promotion... Maybe that's not the thing to look for the next month. Do perhaps do a different book or a different promotion, it sounds like. Absolutely, yes. And just keep trying. And if you're really stuck, email us and be open to feedback. You will get it. Yeah. Right. If you ask for feedback, I actually want feedback. Yes. But that's a, that's a great thing to know as well. If someone is thinking, boy, I've, I've looked, I've looked at my covers, I've looked at my blurb, it seems like everything's right. Sometimes we just don't see things in our own work or it's hard to step outside and see it like a reader. Absolutely. Definitely. You mentioned the first in series free. So I'm curious, and this might be outside of your area on Kobo, but I've heard a lot of authors saying that the first in series free doesn't work as well as it used to. So I haven't heard that it is not as effective as it used to be. If authors are finding that to be the case, it could be because there's just so many more books now than there used to be. 
Um, but we still find it to be very effective when it comes to drawing in readers and getting read through. And I think one thing that authors need to remember is that first in series free doesn't necessarily mean permanently free. You can offer your first in series free for a week, see how it goes. You can offer it for a month, see how it goes. Or if you don't want to offer the entire first book for free, what we've seen some authors doing is writing a prequel, writing a novella that will lead readers into the first book in their series. You can also utilize that as a newsletter magnet as well. Anything else you have suggestion-wise for authors on Kobo, particularly about increasing sales or visibility or anything else? I will do my best to keep this brief because I always have a lot of advice. And again, I asked my team before uh, this interview started just to make sure I didn't miss anything. So I want to offer as much advice as possible. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, global pricing Kobo is a global market. And so you want to make sure your pricing looks as sexy to as many customers as possible. So when you go into your pricing, you'll automatically put in your default currency. So let's say it's USD, but then you'll have the opportunity to alter all of your other currencies and do it. There'll be a suggested price. My advice is to always round up. So even if it's like 623, round up to 699 because it looks nicer and you're going to get that extra like 70 cents, which is who can shake a fist at extra money, right? It adds up, right? So global pricing for sure. And another thing is, I don't know if a lot of authors realize this, but Kobo is a Canadian company. We are based in Canada. Our office is in Toronto. And a lot of our readership is in Canada as well. So if you're doing ads elsewhere, target them to Canada. We also have a big readership in Australia and New Zealand that's growing. So target there. And when you're targeting ads, look for the partner store that exists in that company is, or in that country as well. So using those two examples in Canada, our partner store is at Indigo. In Australia, it will be Booktopia. So target ads include links to partner stores, um, that would be another huge piece of my advice. That's that I is something I did not realize. I knew Canada because I could see where most of my readers were and the pricing part. But I, yeah, I didn't know the name of the the partner store, so that's very useful. If you go to our uh, help center, there is an article that will list all of our partner stores and where they're located. So definitely utilize that. And then just a couple more. Kobo readers love box sets. Um, we run box set specific promotions, I'd say uh, roughly every other month. And one thing we've noticed when it comes to box sets is readers don't necessarily expect a huge discount. So if your books are $4.99 and you're including five of them, you don't necessarily need to drop it to like $15.99 to make it appealing. Kobo readers or Kobo customers will pay for it. It's just the ease of having all of the books at once. So box sets are huge. And then another thing is if you have a new release, if you have a book bub, if you're running ads elsewhere, you're running your own price drop, right? anything along those lines, email us. I have a bazillion spreadsheets with a bunch of different calendars on it to keep track of these. And we want to merchandise your books as much as possible. We can't guarantee anything, but we can't help if you don't tell us. So tell us when you have a new release, tell us when you have a book bub, and we will always do our best to help you as much as we can. Thank you. That is great to know. I think so many of us are used to the more automated systems where if you emailed, it, the response would be, well, here's the web page where you type that in or, you know, not a personal response and not a, something that would say, oh, yeah, we can fit you in here. So that I, that is terrific. When it comes to new releases, my only warning is tell us as early as possible especially with romance. Our romance is huge in indie pub in general. So our romance new release calendar does fill up the fastest, but always tell us as early as possible to make sure that we can get you as much space as we can. Great. Good to know. Well, thank you so much for talking about Kobo Writing Life. As I said, I love the platform. So I was very excited to have you here to talk about it. That's my pleasure. I hope I did uh, my team proud. For those of you who are listening, who are publishing your own work or thinking about it, I hope this was helpful. And everyone, I think you'll enjoy the conversation Rachel and I have about season five and glory and the key and the gift. So stay tuned for that at the end of season five. It'll be one of two bonus episodes about the season.
Gregor tells Buffy she misunderstood. When Glory opens that door to get to her own dimension, it will open all the gates between all the dimensions. The walls separating reality will crumble, the universe will tumble into chaos, and it will all be dark forever. He looks at Dawn and says, that is what you were created for. At 36 minutes, 55 seconds, Buffy finds Dawn, who has gone off alone. Buffy sits next to her, and Dawn says, destroyer of the universe. Guess cutting school doesn't seem so bad now, huh? Buffy tries to assure Dawn it's not her fault and hugs her and says, I won't let anything happen to you, I promise. Gregor speaks quietly to Ben, who says he's just a friend of the family. Gregor asks if Ben would die for them because he will if he stays aligned with Buffy. And Ben responds, it's my life and I'll do what I please with it. But Gregor says it's not just Ben's life. Unimaginable legions will die and Ben can stop all of it. So now we have direct conflict as Gregor expounds and shares some other information that if Ben ends Dawn's life, the will of the beast will be broken, she will fade a distant memory. So we now know this is a way to stop glory for good. And this creates an even greater question of what Ben will do, because Gregor has both played on Ben's desire to be rid of glory, which Gregor doesn't know about, and given Ben a moral justification for killing Dawn. We cut to Dawn, who watches Giles, who's gasping and clearly in pain. Ben joins her, and Dawn tells Ben it's all her fault. He says it's not, but she tells him he doesn't know what's happened, and Ben says he doesn't need to know, and goes on, I just know that sometimes terrible things happen to good people. It shouldn't, but it does. It's nobody's fault. It's just the way life is. As he talks, he prepares a syringe he's behind her and it looks like he might inject her but at 40 minutes two seconds he gives Giles the shot instead then Ben drops the syringe staggers and runs to the next room telling everyone they have to let him out he is frantic and panicked We're now at the climax where the opposing forces have their final clash and resolve it. And here it is Buffy versus Glory. And these are the opposing forces from the previous episode as well. So this works as a climax for a two-part episode or for Spiral as a stand alone. Buffy, seeing Ben's agitation, tells Willow to open a door, but it is too late. At 40 minutes, 36 seconds, Ben turns into Glory. Buffy's eyes widen. Glory looks at her and says, well, what do you know? Little Ben finally did something right. Gregor says, the beast. And Glory says, hey, it's Gregor. She grabs a shield and flings it at him, killing him, and says, now it's not. Spike attacks Glory, then Buffy attacks, but Glory easily fends both of them off, grabs Dawn, and runs out. Anya yells Buffy's name because Buffy is on the ground. The fact that Spike attacked first, I think has to have been deliberate on the writer's part because Buffy, we would expect Buffy to be the first one to protect Dawn, but it takes her an instant and it shows how overloaded Buffy is, how overwhelmed. Outside, Glory punches the invisible barrier and gets through, dragging Dawn after her. Buffy runs out of the station an instant later and right into that barrier. She shouts Dawn's name. The camera is on Buffy, but we hear the sounds of the knights fighting Glory and screaming. Buffy runs back inside, yells for Willow to get the barrier down. Willow's already doing the spell, her eyes black, her breathing labored. Buffy runs back out. The barrier is down. Down, but Dawn and Glory are both gone. This is the second episode in a row where Glory prevailed. Now we are in the falling action part of the story. This is where loose ends are tied up, subplots resolved. It's very short here, and like the last episode, includes a game changer. That's where a main plot story arc 
resolves and something happens that changes the game going forward. At 41 minutes, 44 seconds, the others follow Buffy out. Almost all the knights have been slaughtered. It's dark out. Spike points to Ben's car and yells for someone to get the keys. Willow, who's holding Tara, says, Buffy, Buffy, we have to find Dawn. We can't let Glory. But Buffy sinks to the ground, sitting on the pavement, staring straight ahead. And Willow continues, Buffy, Buffy, you have to get up. We need you. Her voice becomes fainter. It's got an echo and Buffy looks stricken. There is one last faint Buffy and cut. And that is the end of the episode. Very powerful and surprising ending the first time I saw season five. That is it for Spiral other than foreshadowing, which includes spoilers. If you find the way I look at story helpful and want to try it with your own writing, you can download free story structure worksheets. Go to writingasasecondcareer.com slash worksheets. If you're not staying for the foreshadowing section, thank you so much for listening and a special thank you to patrons who support the show. Please come back in two weeks for the next episode. Season 5, Episode 21, The Way to the World, where Willow tries to help Buffy and the others search for a way to defeat Glory. And we are back for foreshadowing and spoilers. This is less spoiler and more my comment. The references to the previous villains and how they overcame them, the rocket launcher, the spell, because remember they combined in a spell to defeat Adam, the uranium power core. Part of why I like it so much is as best as I recall, all of this seems to be forgotten in season seven when the group faces Caleb, who is able to knock Buffy out with one blow. Everyone acts like this is brand new, and yet they have defeated extremely powerful enemies before. And I would have liked this kind of reference to tell us why the previous things won't work. As far as true foreshadowing, Buffy says, no, we're all going to make it. I'm not losing anything anyone. And we see what happens here. In season five, yes, Buffy stops the end of the world, but she sacrifices herself to do it. And in season seven, her attitude has changed. She says of the potential slayers, we're not all going to make it and there's nothing I can do about that. And I have to think her recognizing that has to do with what happened here in season five. All of Ben's reasons for killing Dawn and all the hints in this episode that he might do it, when you get to the end of the episode, it feels like these were all misdirects by the writers. And I remember the first time through feeling a little bit irritated as if, oh, they're trying to make Ben kind of a bad guy and he's not. And what they're really doing is foreshadowing what Ben will do, how he will turn on Dawn, and the moments when he does seem to consider that if he killed her, it would stop everything. So he does sort through these reasons and he does conclude that he won't kill her, not to be a better person, but because he wants to survive. Then there are all the cartoon images, the frying pan, the piano, the direct conversation about cartoons. And maybe it is just to fit a theme for the season, but I also feel it is to foreshadow the cartoony ways that they will use, which all combined help weaken and defeat glory. They use a wrecking ball, a troll hammer, a robot, Things that are a little bit cartoony for Buffy. Last season was a spell, and usually we have Buffy's raw strength, her wits, and magic. 
And what I think is so neat about it is it does not feel cartoony at all when it happens, despite all the calling out of the cartoons. There is some season six set up here for Willow's anger at Buffy over feeling like Buffy's sidekick and over wanting to go head to head with Buffy and see who's more powerful. Because here Buffy says Spike's the only one who has a chance with Glory. And sure, Glory did defeat Willow. But she's also defeated Buffy, and Buffy says after her, only Spike has a chance. So there is a bit of ignoring on Buffy's part Willow's power. Now, that could be because Willow also doesn't have Tara at this moment, and in the past, when she and Tara sent Glory away, that was pretty much the best anyone's done against Glory, but that was the two of them. This whole episode sets up the many reasons Willow brings Buffy back from the dead. Buffy does so much in this episode to try to keep everyone alive. She could have done what Spike suggested, gone off with the Spike and Dawn and maybe Giles, who might be able to provide advice, and just run. She could have told everyone to go different directions because Glory wouldn't know for sure which way to go, but Buffy knew the others would not survive without her, so she came up with this plan to keep everyone together. And at the end of the season, Buffy will, of course, sacrifice herself to protect everyone. So we're building that need for Willow to save her friend who has so many times sacrificed herself to save Willow and to save the world. And Buffy's sacrifice is set up by Gregor describing what will happen. This is the first time we know that it will not be just the end of this world, but apparently of all the universes, at least in the sense of the end for anyone who is on the side of good. It will be unimaginable torment. And then we have perhaps the biggest foreshadowing when Gregor explains about Glory and Ben, not knowing who Ben is, and Buffy says, kill the man and the god dies. This explains to the audience why Giles is so sure that killing Ben will end Glory. He didn't hear this, but we presume he learns the same thing from his books, and the gang will have a conversation about that. So now we know that also the gang could kill Ben or Buffy could kill Ben, except that Buffy doesn't kill humans. So that sets up a fantastic story question of will someone use this as a way to get rid of glory? There are a ton more things I could cover here. The episode is filled with foreshadowing, but I will leave it at that. Thank you again for listening and again to patrons who not only support the show, but get to hear additional content, including a bonus episode about intervention, the Buffy Bot episode, and get to listen to episodes at least two days before they release. I hope you will all come back in two weeks for Season 5, Episode 21, The Way to the World, where the key action takes place in Buffy's mind. If you want to hear more Buffy and the Art of Story content and would like to support the podcast at the same time, you can do so at patreon.com slash Lisa M. Lily, that's L-I-S-A, M is in Marie, L-I-L-L-Y, or at buymeacoffee.com slash Lisa M. Lily. Comment on the episodes or connect with me on Instagram or Twitter at Lisa M. Lily or by visiting the Buffy and the Art of Story Facebook page or email your comments to buffystorypod at gmail.com. Music for this episode was written and performed by Robert Newcastle. Buffy and the Art of Story is a production of Spiny Woman LLC, copyright 2022. All rights reserved.